could sing uh, as a deer. As the deer pant the floor, the water so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart, desire wanted to take the opportunity to do that since you all can't. So I'm uh, really happy to be here and you may be seated for just a second. I just talk to you for a second here. And, um, had a really nice time up at the minister's meeting over the weekend and uh, just wanted to express my, uh, my thankfulness to Brother Dan who had arranged it and the brothers that came and attended. It was, it was really good. So you'll have to nod for me because everybody behind that just kind of is throwing me for a loop. I guess the good thing is I can't see you frown if I say something wrong. Um, but yeah, so it just had a really nice time and I really appreciated the brothers that came. It was just such a nice atmosphere um, of the brothers that came and it was a, really a great opportunity, I, I thought, to just be able to get together and just talk about the things of God. And, and uh, it was quite an interesting situation with Brother Chad being asked to, to speak, no doubt. And I can see the hand of God in it for it as well, you know, but... You know, like he said, he would have been quite burdened and nervous coming, but now I'm bearing the burden of my brother. But that's scriptural. We're supposed to bear one another's burdens, and I want to be found faithful to bear the burden of my brother. And uh, so here we are today. I'm bearing the burden. Um, but I, I just um, was up praying, and you all know me enough by now. I have nothing to put on for anybody. So I just tell you how I, I come to these things. I don't like to preach. <laughs> like, I really don't like to stand here. It's a scary thing. Always scares me. Always bothers me. I literally was up till past midnight last night. Couldn't sleep all night up at three praying this morning. Not because there isn't a lot of word. Like we have a lot of word. And anybody with an education could take some scriptures and take some quotes and put it together and put together a pretty great um, subject matter that we all would, would, would love, right? 
but it's that burden you have to catch the mind of God and the Spirit of God and just say what He wants you to say and then to say no more. And that's, um, I'm learning that. I, I think we all have to learn that by obedience to just say what He said and then be quiet when He doesn't want you to say anything more. And so I was up praying, you know, and seeking the Lord and I'm like, well, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I go by inspiration a lot of times and I wait and I wait and I wait and nothing's coming to me. Like, I'm like, Lord, this is torture. This is absolutely torture. It's midnight and I'm like, I have no idea what I'm ministering on. No idea. I know some people think, well, you, you're crazy. You're talking crazy. You, certainly you have something. Like, no, I have nothing. I have no thoughts. You have thoughts, but you don't know what is his, his will in the whole thing, right? And then I got to looking at my subject matter, and I told Brother Chad, I said, maybe it's because the subject matter I'm going into. I'm waiting for God to move upon me. I'm waiting for something. I'm waiting for a, a mighty rushing wind. I'm waiting for a, a fire. I'm waiting for a thunder to say, this is my will. Walk ye in it. Go tell them this, you know? And it's not happening that way. It's just real calm, you know? I just had a little thought, and that little thought, I just said, well, I'll just bring that. And uh, if that's the still small voice speaking, then that's just what I want to say is just what he wants us to say because we don't want to be found doing anything other than what his will is and his will is his word his will is his word so i trust that this little thought for you will be okay um y'all love me right okay so you have no choice then no matter what and how bad i i blow it you're going to love me either way and you're going to put your arm around me and say i love you and, and that's what we do as christians right we look beyond the the faults and mistakes of a man and his insecurities and his failures and say, ah, oh, I love that, that, that little attribute of God that manifests in you. So why don't you stand? And if you will, turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapters 2. So having been one with a mask in church, I do know that you yawn a lot. For lack of oxygen, I am sympathetic to that. And I can't see it, so it's okay. But if you pitch over, I will call you out. <laughs> it's just the reality of it. I know, I sit back and I'm like, I'm glad Brother Chad can't see how many times I'm yawning right now. It's not because I'm, I'm just lack of oxygen. You're about to pass out sometimes, you feel like. So don't pass out. Stay awake, stay alert, okay? And I can't hear you, so you'll have to say amen a little louder, right? Say, say, if you agree with it, take a hold of it, right? We don't just let it pass by. We say, hey, that's mine. I'm taking a hold of it. We don't want to just be a hearer and not a doer of the word. We want to take it and make it ours, right? So we want to participate in these things. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And if you also turn to 1 Kings 19, 9. First Kings 19.9. Just say amen when you're there. Okay, I can't hear you. That's good. And he came thither unto a cave, and he lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle, and he went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, 
there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? If you will, just bow your heads for a word of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come before you, Lord. Um, Lord, humbly, Lord, we come before your throne, Lord, of mercy this morning. And Lord, we ask, Lord, that you would do that which we cannot do in and of itself, Father, that you would take the word, Lord, and break it and give it to us, Father. Lord God, we are a needy people. And Lord, we're learning as we're going, Lord, as Lord, you learned obedience to the things that you suffered, Father God, so are we. And I just pray, Lord, you'd take the little burden and thought that's in my heart, Lord, and that you could bring it to your people, that it would bless them and help them, Lord. And I know my insufficiency, and I know my dependence. It's a complete dependence. So, Father God, I just pray, Lord, that you would take this vessel. Lord, shut my mouth to any of my own thoughts and let me just speak what you would once said. And, Father God, may you help the people that are before me, Lord, your most precious people, Father. Lord, that they could receive the things that you want to say to them. Lord, that it could set them free, that it could call them up higher, that it would reveal to them the spiritual realities of their sonship, Father. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you would be glorified in everything that's said and done, Lord, in our midst today. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So, a uh, little title. Um, it's a strange title. Um, what hearest thou? Sayest the amen to the amen. What hearest thou? Sayest the amen to the amen. And a part of this is uh, coming from a personal experience for me, myself. I'm, I'm a, a man of no reputation, so I never make myself as a reputation of being someone that gets it right all the time. I don't. I'm a far cry from somebody that gets it right all the time. But I do see the hand of God and the grace of God in my life to correct me. And that gives me a comfort because his rod and his staff are a comfort to us. And there's not a one of us here that hasn't experienced the difficulties, I think, of this mask thing, right? And the difficulties of the whole COVID thing and the whole thing that's like, hey, why are we coming subjected to things that we don't need to come subjected to other than it's the word of God? And when we hear those things, it's something that I found that's a war inside of me constantly. And I realize that I'm constantly wanting to buck um, status quo trends um, for my own self. And I'm realizing that my greatest enemy is still me. It's still me. No matter how much I know and how much God has done for me, if I won't submit myself to the littlest of his commands, I have usurped my will over his. And that's a very dangerous place for any of us all to be, is to ever put our will above his will. Because the amen, the bride, doesn't do that. And we're, I want to go into looking at that and the, and the character and the aspects of the son and daughters of God in the hour in which we're living is we submit ourselves to every word of God as little as it may be. And many times we'll accept the great big things, but then we'll stumble at the little things. And we wonder why, what is wrong? It's because you're not hearkening into his voice. You're wanting something big. You're wanting the fire. You're wanting the earthquake. You're wanting God to do something great big. And he speaks to you as a still small voice of his word. And that word never changes. It's immovable. And if you want God, you accept his word. So simple, so humble, it goes over the highest, most intellectual minds in this word, world. If you want him, take him at his word. But we have this carnal nature about us that's constantly trying to view God as something great, big, glorious, mighty, powerful, which he is. But that great God has so veiled himself in the simplicity of his word that it constantly stumbles the carnal mind. And what stumbles me, what, what, what Lord brought my attention to is, you know, when that came out, I said something and I was wrong. I told the other deacons, I do not want to wear a mask. I've been unveiled before my God. Why should I put a mask back on? Why? I didn't want to do it. But there was a little voice in my head that said, but his word says. <laughs> and then I went to prayer. I never said anything, but I went to prayer. And right there, I was praying, prayed for about an hour. And I was like, Lord, I, I don't know. And, and something came to me and said, it's the humbling of the bride. Now, you take that for what it is. Man, I'm not going to say it was thus saith the Lord. I'm not going to say anything like that. But for me, maybe it was the humbling of Kyle. <laughs> maybe it wasn't for everybody, for the humbling of Kyle, because we had to observe him. He was meek and lowly coming in on the fold of an ass. And if you want to be like him, you're going to walk in his footsteps. And you're not going to take a different path that he took to get there. Right? 
And when, you know, I, I go back in the Bible and I look, you know, and we see John, or Revelations 5, you know, and I, I preached on behold the lamb, you know, and, and as we look at that behold the lamb, as I start to look at him more and more, uh, he hears a voice, the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed. And everyone, no doubt John's looking as a type of the bride saying, here he comes, <laughs> the mighty God, the sword in his hand to correct the, op the, the situation. And he turns and sees the most powerful thing that could have ever been expressed, a bloody lamb. That's a shocking situation. How could the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the great and mightiest one amongst us in the whole universe, take the form of a, a little humble man, no beauty that we should behold him, and let them rip his beard out, let them spit, him in, spit at him in the face, rip off his clothes and humiliate him before all flesh. And he didn't do anything. He said nothing. He let them do it. That to me is just so shocking and so humbling and I'm so ashamed of my attitude in the presence of, of that, you know? It's something I, I'm realizing, you know, it's one thing to know him and it's another thing to know him. You know about him, but to know him, I think, is to walk in his footsteps. That brings a whole new reality of knowing him, right? You can, before two people are married, you can tell them about marriage and all that goes with it. You say, beware, you know, hey, say whatever you want, sweetie. You know, those little things right there, right? Those little things you kind of, but once they become married, then they have to go through those difficulties of working things out and situations and humbling themselves and saying they're sorry and realizing they were wrong, right? They're knowing on a completely different level because now they're experiencing those things that they were told and now they have to put them into action to actually see the fruit of what they've been told, right? And so as I, I, I just sit in there, you know, and I knew God did that, and I had to, I had to go, and I had to go pray about it. And I, and I just, when I did, and I was looking at the scriptures, and I just come back, and the simplicity of it is, God is such a gentleman, he's so gentle, and he is so meek that he will not force his will upon you. He's so gentle. It's shocking. Remember, it even stumbled John the Baptist. He was so gentle. Are you the one? Like the high places made low? Oh, yeah, they were. But it wasn't in the carnal realm that you could see. But it was spiritually taking place. Strongholds were breaking. And so in, in looking at that, I, I, just, I just came back to the realization, no matter how much I don't want to do this, his will must take preeminence over my will. Because his will is his word. Period. Like, Amen. Amen? Amen? You want to know the will of God? It's his word. It will never deviate from that. You will never get so high in your revelation that you will ever discount and diminish one of his least commands. True revelation will put you in humble obedience to every word that God has asked you to walk in. That's a great revelation. If you can break for me the whole seven seals and you can't walk in the simplicity of God's word, I'm wondering, I'm wondering, because we have a pattern of this, and the scripture is very clear of these things, that God never deviates from his word because he is the word, period. And so many times, like, uh, you'd say, I had an experience, you know, so like back there in the back, I'm thinking, I'm like, well, Lord, I really don't want to preach. <laughs> like, I really don't want to do this. Yeah, like, don't, you don't understand. And I don't understand how a person really wants to preach. Like, I still don't understand that. Like, I don't get it. Like you see men and they just want to get up there and talk. And I'm like, I don't want to say nothing. Like I want to go hide. And I, I still wrestle with that. But like in, in and of myself, I'm like, but I, I know you spoke to me. And I know I'm supposed to minister to your people. I know you called me to minister to be a servant to your bride. I know you did. And I checked my experience and my revelation with your word and it matched the word. Because if I had a revelation of something that the word said no, I would have to bow down to that and say, your word is true and my revelation is a lie. My thought, my experience, even if an angel from heaven come and tell you something other than what I'm telling you right now, let him be accursed. It does not matter. God never moves from his word because he is the word. And I think in humbling ourselves, Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. What obedience did he come to? The word. The prophet of God said that. Church age book. What obedience did he learn? to learn to not pursue his will, but the will of the Father. He had a job to do. He had a role to play, just as you do, and so do I. 
We have a job to do. We're here to be the Word made manifest. We're here to reflect His will, which is His Word, completely and utterly so simple, so humble, that I wonder if people will accept it. Like, I, I wonder. Because we always want something great big, something great beyond, something that's mighty and powerful, and we don't want to humble ourselves to the simplicity of Him and His Word. And influences, Brother Branham said, and I have a lot. I, I, I was like, I don't know what to preach. And I looked down, I got 15 pages. I'm like, what in the world is this? Like, I don't understand this. So influence, Brother Branham says here, always be conscious of your littleness, not your bigness. Today, we as Americans, we so much want to think of ourselves as a big somebody. We belong to something great big or some big organization or something, something big that we got. Oh, but great big Big is all that we ever want to see. And that one time in the Bible, we, see, we have seen an example of that. There was a prophet, went back into a cave, Elijah, and God was trying to attract his attention to come out. And there came a fire, a smoke, and a blustering winds across the mountains, and a thunder, and an earthquake, and a shakings, and everything else. The prophet never even moved. God wasn't even in it. But when he heard that still, small voice speak, he covered his face and he came forward. When the still, small voice of God's word speaks, not in a racket, not in some great big denomination or something big something, but that still, small voice of his word that's looked over and that, call, that still calls man to repentance. God is his word. Always his word. And so we see what attracted this foreordained, predestinated prophet of God that could call fire out of the heavens. Nothing but the Word. Nothing was an attraction to him. And that's why I think what we're doing is we're maturing in the Lord. I really do believe that. I believe as he walked in those footsteps and learned obedience through much suffering, and what do you suffer? Anytime you try to pursue your will over God's will, you're going to pay a price his rod and his staff will come and correct. And his rod and his staff is a comfort to us. As his children, we love it. We don't despise it. We want it. It hurts, but we want it. But he learned that obedience through much suffering. And so is the bride learning to just obey his voice, which is his word. And sometimes I know we want to make it something big. But I, 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 my prayer is that each and every one of us, because I'm included in this, you go down in your own life today and you find out where's that one little thing he just keeps whispering to me and he won't let me. It, I just, I, I'm trying to cover it over with something else. I'm trying to cover it over with praying or coming to church or trying to do things. And there's that little, little check down in the side of me. And he keeps saying, why are you bypassing me? Why are you trying to get to me? Because I'm right there in that little word that you keep bypassing. That little humble request that I have for you. Because God is in that word. You know, Enoch was a perfect reflection of that word. He became the living word to his hour because he perfectly reflected the word that, he was, that was revealed to him in every step of his journey, in every manner of his life. As each of us would do in our own way, we would have the simplicity of you say, well, God really doesn't care how I act at work. Oh, yes, he does. You don't talk to men. I don't care how mean they are to you. You don't talk back to them mean. That's his word. You love those that despitefully use you and, you persecute, and persecute you, right? That's the simplicity of his word. But why do we want to bypass that? And we say, hey, yeah, but I have a revelation in the seventh seal. I know the prophet of God to the age and I'm his bride. What did he want a bride for? He don't want a bride just so you can, he can say, I have a bride. He wants a bride to reproduce himself, to bring the word and made flesh amongst us today in the hour in which we're living. The bride has a purpose to reproduce Christ. Christ is the word. From Genesis to Revelations, he's the amen. The so be it, let it be done. And the bride says the same thing, so be it, let it be done. Not my will, but thine will be done. See, we're still learning, we're walking in those footsteps. And I'm not, I'm not pushing anybody out, I'm not pushing anybody in, that's not what I'm doing. We wanna find our bad spots, right? So I expose my bad spots, but I don't think I'm the only one. I think we're all maturing in these things and realizing, you know what? Hey, I am still my greatest enemy, and I am hindering the move of God if I won't humble myself to the least of his desires. That's just the truth. 
God hiding himself in simplicity. When Elijah was back there in the cave and the smoke went across, the blood, the thunders, the lightnings, you see, and all those kinds of sensations, we've had blood on the face and hands and sensations and everything. They ne it never even bothered that prophet. He just laid there and he heard that still small voice. And what is it? The word. Then he covered his face and he walked out to see what it was. Remember, friends, don't look for something big. You say, God, he speaks of great big things. There'll come a time that this will be this and this will be that and it'll be great big things. I hope you're catching what I'm talking about, see? Great big things. When this comes to pass, it'll be great big like this, but it'll be so humble that you'll miss the entire thing. It'll go right on. It's God hiding himself in simplicity. You'll look back there and say, well, that never did that. See, it, see, it passed right over the top of you and you never even seen it. It was so simple. You see, God lived in that simplicity to manifest himself in his greatness. What makes him great? Because he can simplify himself. A, great, a big, great man can't simplify himself. He's got to be a dignitary, see? But he ain't big enough yet. When he, become, when he comes big enough, then he comes down like you, you see? He can humble himself. Wow. I'm, I got a lot, so it's okay, right? We're just going to fly through this, and we'll see where he wants to go with it. He says, like that, it means whatever. Oh, okay, so here he is. He is the God of the amen. This is a continuation of, um, of that. He never changes. What he does never changes. He said it, and he stands fast. He does it, and it's done forever. None can take from what he says or add to it. So let it be, Amen. So let it be, you, aren't you glad that you serve that kind of a God? You can know exactly, listen to this, you can know exactly where you are with him at any time and all the time because he is the amen God and he won't change. Amen. You want to check your experience, you want to do a checkup, just check your life with the simplicity of his word and you'll find where you're standing in his presence. It's that simple. You don't need a pastor. You don't need a preacher. You don't need an angel. You don't need a mighty rushing wind. You check your experience with his word. Brother Banham said that, and you'll find where you're standing in his presence. So simple. So simple. Now I know why I had no inspiration. Like I couldn't feel anything other than so simple. Just a whisper of his word. I myself was still looking for something big, but he gave me his word. He whispered it to me. He just whispered it. I like that, Brother Bam says, I like that. It means that whatever he said, it's final. It means that whatever he said in the first age and to the second and to all the other age about his own church and about the false vine is exactly right and it won't change. It means that what he started out with in Genesis, he will finish in Revelations. He has to be, for he is the amen. Let it be. Now we can see again why the devil hates the book of Revelations and Genesis. He hates the truth. He knows that the truth will prevail. He knows what his end will be and how he fights that. But we are on the winning side. I'm going to keep going because it'll get good. <laughs> A quick look at those scriptures which involves the Lord Jesus overcoming to bring the truth of this proposition, Matthew 4. He overcame the personal temptations of Satan by the word, personal temptations, and by the word only. In each of the three major trials that corresponded exactly to the temptations of the Garden of Eden, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, Jesus overcame by the word. And Eve fell to the personal temptation of Satan by falling to, you, to failing to use the word. Adam fell in direct disobedience to the word. But Jesus overcame by the word. And right now, let me say this. The only way to be an overcomer is to, it also is the only way that you can know that you're actually overcoming because the word can't fail. <sighs> See, you want something outside of the word and it's proving, ah, uh, that's what a false vine's looking for. 
False vine's constantly looking for something out of his word for vindication of what he is and that he's in the will of God. I can show that to you, and we'll, I will here in a minute. Now notice how Jesus overcame the world systems of religion. When he was repeatedly badgered by the theologians of his day, he constantly applied the word. He spoke only what the Father gave him to speak. There was not a time when the world was, was not utterly confused by his wisdom, for his wisdom was of God. But in his own personal life, when he was contending with himself, he overcame by obedience to the word of God. Amen. Hebrews 5, 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he was offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, not taking away your sonship, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. What was he obedient to? The word of God. Now then, there will not be one person who will sit in the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ unless he has been living that word. There's the qualification. Unless you've been living that word, I don't care if you can quote it to me, unless you've been the expression of that living word, you will not sit on that throne with him because you will constantly be found as one pursuing your own will, your own desires above the will and purpose of God. Very simple. You will by your own default eliminate yourself from that position. You will do it yourself. You'll count yourself unworthy because you'll pursue your own desire. See, it's, it's, you see how God's just so, so quiet. He's just whispering his desires to you, and then he's checking to see what you'll do. He's not going to have a wife that he has to force into loving him. He just won't do that. Jesus said, if you say that you love me and you don't keep my commandments, you're a liar. Like, I don't have to say it. He said it. His word is his will, and if you don't love him, you don't love his word, you'll pursue your own will. It's as simple. No person, will sit, uh, person who will sit upon the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ unless he's been living that word. Your prayers, your fastings, your repentances, no matter what you present to God, none of that will gain you the privilege of sitting on that throne. It will only be granted to a word bride. Just a word bride. See why you have to humble yourself, become like a little child? Just real simple, Lord, I don't know nothing. You show me where I'm not obeying, I'm not expressing that word, I, I want to walk in it. As a wife, I want to be found as the wife that God would want me to be found, right? As a husband, I want to be that kind of an expression that you were to me to, to, to really be that living word for you, right? That's just that desire. Don't be getting tired on me. I see a couple of you. I see a couple of you. You're all right. You can take a breath. Believe me, it's okay. Just breathe a little bit. See a couple of them going like this. It's okay. It does mess me up, but it's okay, right? <laughs> just relax. So I'm going to have to get a little oxygen tubes, you know, underneath the seats, you know, and pump them in there. Yeah, Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. He says, as the throne of the king is shared with the queen because she is united with him, so only they who are of that word, even as he is of that word, will share that throne. His word only are on the amen side. See why I'm saying it's the amen to the amen. We have nothing, we're not saying, hey, but I know this, 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 this. No, don't care. Are you obedient to what he's asked you to do? really don't care about anything else anymore. I really don't. Like I, I'm not looking for anything great and big. I know it's hidden in the simplicity of humble moms, dads, kids, older grandmas and grandpas, just faithfully doing what he's called us to do in the hour in which we're living, the word expression. It says here that, we are earth, uh, that he hid this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power of God, that the power may be of God and not of us. For we are troubled on every side, we are distressed, we're perplexed, but we are not in despair. We are persecuted, but we're not forsaken or cast down, and, but not destroyed. 
always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus may be made manifested in our body. For we which are alive, always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifested in our mortal flesh. We're always dying out to your will. You're always dying out. And you know what? Next week, you'll be dying out again to something else. And then the month after that, you're going to find out there's something else I'm dying because you're always dying. That's your, you're walking in his footsteps. Yeah, there's a lot. Wow, a lot of scriptures here in my mind. So Romans, I will, I will just keep flying because I'm not even close. Romans 8, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecutions, famines, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Every day, every hour of every day, I'm dying. You want to walk in his footsteps? Remember, it's a bloody lamb. You want to take the book? Remember, it's a bloody lamb takes the book. Only the bloody lamb takes the book to make it live. You could quote it, but you can't make it live. You, you understand? Yeah. Now I'm kind of wondering and knowing why I, I by, by inspiration, I preach that, behold the lamb. I see. I see, for one, for me, I, 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 I took on the wrong nature for a second, and I tried to pursue my will, and I didn't realize that's antichrist. Antichrist is anything other than his word. That's the spirit of Antichrist. Don't think it can't work on you. Anything that causes you to deviate from the least of his commands is an Antichrist spirit working upon you. Remember, till that devil is cast in the lake of fire, he's doing everything he can to keep you from walking in that word. Everything he can. My computer went dark. It had to look at me. So now, here's the, here's, we're getting to the, the meat of what I, this inspiration. Lean not to your own understanding. Now, I think our education is good today. If we said to our sons and to, our, and to the sons of God that it's all right to have an education, there's nothing against that. But when your education is contrary to the word of God, then you lean to the word and you let your education go. See, because the word, the education will stand and, and will give you a good job and probably a good standing amongst very intellectual people. But that's, and that's all right, which will probably be a great help to you, help you in your financials and help you in your livelihood, make living a little bit easier for you. But remember one thing, my son, you've got to die no matter how much education you got, how much culture and how much you are able to accumulate, you've got to face death because it is written, men must die and after this the judgment. And God and death is so bad, but coming to that judgment, that's the bad part. But now you die, but after that the judgment. Now it's going to be required of you what you did with your understanding of God's word. That's where the requirement comes because that, your education is fine, but the word of God is the life. My word is life and, and to know it is life. And he said to know him, well, he is the word. So you can only know him by the word for he is the word. That's the only way you'll ever know him is by his word. So simple, it's gotta stay simple. Because only someone big can make themselves simple. So, Brother Bam says here, this headstone was crying grace, grace. It's passed from death and from creed into the living word of a living God. God's only provided plan for this age was his sons in the word, uh, word age will be quickened by the spirit like a spark that's lit off of something that's been alive. And it's seated now in heavenly places already alive and subject to every promise in the word. And what does that do? You being a part of God's gene, a part of the word, other men, uh, a part of God's word, are seated together and they're manifesting the entire body of Christ because there's no leaven among you. You see, there's no leaven among you. It's just the word only seated in those heavenly places, in the door where he has put his name. Mm, where two ways meet, the cross, yours and his. 
Yeah, still an open door. Now, here it is. This is the one I wanted to get to. Resume of the ages, Balaam. We learn in no uncertain terms that this false vine is a vine of Satan. Their gathering is of him, Satan. They meet in the name of, the, of God and they lie that they are Christ's. They preach, they teach, they baptize, they worship, they partake of various rites that are given in the church by Christ. Yet they are not of God, but since they say that they are, God will hold them responsible. And in each age, he speaks to them. They remind us exactly of Balaam. He had a prophetic office. He knew the proper approach unto God as demonstrated in the sacrifices of clean beasts. Yet he was not a word prophet. For when God told him not to go to honor Balak with his presence, he sought to go anyway, for he was motivated by lust of gold and prestige. So God let him go. The perfect will of God gave way to the permissive will of God because of the heart's desire of Balaam. God actually said, go ahead. Did God change his mind? No, sir. God had his way regardless of what Balaam was going. Balaam did not annul the will of God. God had his way regardless. It was Balaam who was the loser for he bypassed the word. His own human desire, his heart desire, bypassing the word, he made himself a loser. And today we have the very same thing, women preachers, organizations, false doctrines, and et cetera, and people worshiping God, manifesting in the spirit, and going right on as did Balaam, claiming that God had spoken to them, them even when the commission received was opposite to the revealed word, and will not defy that God spoke to them. Or, and I will not deny that God spoke to them. But it was just like when he spoke to Balaam the second time, and he knew that Balaam wanted his own heart's desire above the word, and he gave it to him. And yet all the while in the end having his own way, even so today, God tells folks, just go ahead in your own heart's desires because they've already rejected the word. But the will of God will be done regardless. Amen. I hope you see this. It will, it will not only clear up much of what we've seen in the ages, but especially in this last age with so much manifestation and external blessings when the whole period is against the word revealed will of God. Mm. So you see, God will let you go right on and he'll keep blessing you. <laughs> he'll keep blessing you. Those children of Israel that came out, he still fed them manna from heaven. He still let their shoe latches not break. He gave them water when they were thirsty. He took care of them. He calls it the rain to fall on the just and the unjust, right? He pours out, he does blessings for all, but you know what it does? It just reveals the one that loves him and the one that don't. The one that don't. It's just a revealer. These little things all along the way that God keeps letting come our way is going to be the revealer of the heart's desire of each of us. I don't think we're done. I don't think we're close. I think we are all having to learn obedience through suffering. And I'm not saying it ain't suffering. I know you all are suffering behind that right now. I know you are. And I, and I know that there's many, many things that we have to suffer. But for his sake, we'll do it. Because if God is going to do anything, he's going to check your heart's desire. He'll do it with everything you can imagine. I, th this is one little thing. You know that, right? There's so many things he's checking your heart's desire. You think he's not mindful of you every day watching? Where is his heart's desire? You know, Brother Branham says when God chooses a bride, he's speaking of what kind of home he wants, right? When he picks a woman, right? So do you think God's going to pick a bride that constantly just wants to do her own thing? Like always wants to just do her thing and God, I want you to bless me in it. And you know what he'll do? He'll bless you. He will bless you and you'll think you're fine. And all you did was expose you don't have the heart and desire of God. You did it. He blessed you. 
that's scary. That scares me. That scares me. That scares me for the people. It really does. To know that the Almighty God will still bless you and give you the desires of your heart, but it won't be His desire, and you will completely reject Him along the path, and you thought you were fine. The people of the world, the denominational systems, they're blessed, they're, they're healed, they get all kinds of it, and they think God's with them in that. And just like Balaam, they rejected the Word. God still blesses them, but they rejected Him, the Word. God's checking to find His bride that wants His will and His will only, which is His Word. Nothing more than that. So simple. You see? Real, real, real simple. Hebrews 3.7, if you want to turn there. Just realized we are where that thought I just said was. So Hebrews 3, 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation of the day of temptation in the wilderness. So this day of temptation in the wilderness, what do you think God was doing at this period of time? It was a great temptation. He was checking their desires. They were in a wilderness. Why didn't they just come out and go in? He gave space to check their desires. He had few, very few, very tiny few that actually had a heart's desire for the will of God to be fulfilled. The rest, he still blessed. Gave them their heart's desires. Why do you think we didn't take a body change 50 years ago? He's checking heart's desires. He's learning obedience. We're all learning obedience. Much suffering. When your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation, I said, they do always err in their heart, and they have not, for they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in the departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom he was grieved for 40 years, was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness, to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should come, seem to come short of, for unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Simply they heard the word, they recognized their prophet, but they didn't humble themselves to just take him at his word and obey it along the way. Brother Branham said, you can agree with the word. You can say it's the truth, but until you unite with it, it doesn't do you any good whatsoever. See, there's a difference between sympathizing. There's a difference between flirters and a wife. There's a big difference. You'll find it in their heart's desire. Always hidden in simple things. First Peter 2.7. Please turn. First Peter 2, 7. Unto you, therefore, which believed, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and an holy nation, 
a peculiar people, that we should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of this darkness unto his marvelous light, which in times past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against your soul. We're all warring against them. We all have these uh, human desires and reasonings that we would like to bypass the simplicity of his will and try to pursue our own. And it's, it's just hidden in so many things. Now, let's look at the amen bride. Revelations uh, of Jesus Christ, the church age. Now remember this, Christ in the true church is the continuation of the book of Acts. But the book of Revelation shows that how the antichrist spirit would come into the church and defile it, making it lukewarm, formal, and powerless. It is exposing Satan, revealing his works, and his attempted destruction of God's people. How? By discrediting God's word. Right down to the time that he is cast into the lake of fire, he fights that. He cannot stand it. He knows that if the people get a true revelation of the true church and what she is and what she stands for and that she can do the greater works, she will be an invincible army. If they get a true revelation of the two spirits within the framework of the Christian church and by God's grace, our spirit discern and withstand the antichrist spirit. So does the bride have to withstand the antichrist spirit? So what is the antichrist spirit? Anything contrary to the word. Anything. You pick. Anything. So simple. But anything. That's an antichrist spirit. And you're going to fight it until he's thrown into the lake of fire. Your will over his. Justify it. Give it a good reasoning. We all do it. I'm guilty, right? I'm not. I'm not. I'm the one guilty. I'm pointing to me, right? So just so you know, I'm not picking on anybody. I'm pointing at me. I was the one guilty. I'm the one who he told point blank something. And I'm the one who justified by my own human reasoning something that was contrary to the simplicity of his word. I didn't even realize it, but I was up against the antichrist spirit that was coming after me. I didn't even realize it until God brought my attention to it. I said, oh my goodness, and I had to repent. I did repent. And I really was down because I realized how subtle the enemy was. He's so subtle, it shocked me. Like I had no idea he would use such a simple, like why does that care? Why? So simple, but I had a word on it. And that was God. And I was gonna bypass God and take an evil spirit. That's how you get evil spirits. You bypass the word. So simple. It's, it's, you see, it's, it's, we have to discern these things. We have to be able to withstand the two spirits that are work within the framework of the Christian church, an antichrist spirit, which is anything anti-God, anti-word, right? It can sound beautiful, but who's hidden in beauty? And then who's hidden <laughs> and no beauty that we should be holding? No, nothing that we're like, wow, that's great. No, that's just what he said. Oh, I like it. I don't. Y'all don't have to get excited. That makes me excited. I don't know. I just like it when God per talks to me personally and he shows me something and he shows me, even in my mistake, how this thing is working so slyly, so sly. And then God won't come down and thunder out judgment because you go that way. He doesn't. If you're his, he'll correct you. He'll give you a spanking. But you know what? You can still bypass that and still go to your own will. And you know what he'll do? He'll bless you. He'll just keep blessing you. Bless you, bless you, bless you. He told you it wasn't right, but, whoa. Yeah. So, she can do the greater work. She's an invincible army if they get a true revelation of the two spirits within the framework of the Christian church and by God's spirit discern and withstand the Antichrist spirit. Satan will be powerless before her. He'll be as definitely thwarted today as when Christ withstood his every effort to gain power over him in the desert. Yes, Satan hates revelation, but we love it. With real, true revelation in our lives, the gates of hell cannot prevail against us, but we will prevail against them. Satan's Eden. Then Satan got to Eve to listen to his gospel of theology, the gospel of knowledge and higher schooling and of higher ethics and of a better civilization and of higher education and so forth. So you see what he was doing? Man, he was selling it. He was good at selling it. Like it sounded good. It was great. Educated. 
But God's simple, humble word was still there. It never went anywhere. It was just simple. See, this is what I think God's doing, right? We've had a lot of things in 50 years, a lot of things that comes up and comes down, and you start to realize, well, I wonder what this is really all about. I think God's really just checking the desires of people's heart. If you want something great big, he'll give it to you. But if you want him, it'll be hidden in the simplicity of a lamb slain from before the foundation of the world and your identity with the lamb, which is the word. And you'll be killed all the day long for walking with it. Um, oh, computers. There we go. See, uh, higher education and so forth. Then when he got to her to stop and to listen to him for just one minute to his reasonings, which he had commanded us to cast down, that's when he got her to listen. Now, you looky here. Church, uh, the church is so-and-so. It's to be established for so long. We're one of the oldest churches here. We have the mayor coming to our church. I don't care what it is. You see, if it's against God's word, you be against it. That is your enemy. Anything that's against the word is your enemy. Everything that's for the word is your brother. He's a part of you. So you see, when the enemy comes in like a flood, I'm not trying to shoot at uh, you. Uh, I'm just trying to shoot at the spirit of Antichrist that would be working to try to paralyze and make us formal and powerless. Amen. So, right, that's what we do. We identify something by the word, and you say, ah, that's not the word, brother. Right. Uh, sister, that's not the word. I, I know God's blessing you in that career that you're pursuing, but that's not the word. Right. Like, you can pursue that career if you want to, but it's not the word. Let the older woman instruct the younger woman on how to be what? On, you answer it yourself. Keepers at home and how to balance a career. Not what he said. That's not his word. But you know what? He'll bless you in it. You go right ahead. God will bless you. But don't you want to do his will? Like, don't you want to be found faithful and say, don't you want to hear those words? Well done, good and faithful servant. You didn't pursue your own will. You pursued mine. Because thou hast walked in thine own choosing, he told Brother Bam. And it was the harder way you have Pick the precise and correct way, and it is my way, right? But Brother Bannum had to learn things, you know that? He fell lots of times. He came under wrong influences. He came under wrong influences of preachers sometimes. Remember that? That was his big mistake. He came under wrong influences, and God would correct him, just as he'll correct his bride. He corrects me, and I believe he'll correct you, because we just want to do his will. There's nothing good, great about us. There's no big ones among us, right? If the King of kings and Lord of lords made himself of no reputation, what do I have? I got nothing. I got no reputation. I think when the bride loses her reputation, she'll see God manifested in ways she never thought possible. She stops trying to do things in her own strength. She'll see the power of God manifest like never before. So humble. So Brother Branham tells us a story here the way of the true prophet. <clears throat> you know, a lot of times angel come, angels come down. Boy, and how the Pentecostals will sure eat that up. How about when St. Martin was standing there, and here stood a great bright beam stood before him. And, a man was bap and the man who baptized in Jesus' name, who believed in the Holy Ghost and kept the word. And the Romans kicking him out and doing everything to him, trying to give him their dogmas and their man-made doctrines, and the man stood on the word. One day, in his power, the devils would come up to him and try to talk to him. He wouldn't even pay them any attention. One day, Satan came like that, like Christ, crowned, golden slippers on, stood there and said, don't you see blazes of fire all around him? Said, don't you recognize me, Martin? I am your Lord, worship me. Martin looked at him and said, there's something wrong here. He said, Martin, can't you recognize me? He said, I'm your Lord and Savior. He said, worship me. He said it three times. Martin looked around. He seen Christ will be crowned by his people at his coming. He wouldn't be wearing no golden slippers. He said, you get away from me, Satan. Oh, how the Pentecostals would sure be eating that up. You see, how did he discern this false image that was placed before him of Christ. It didn't match the original word. It didn't match. 
It didn't fit. Really doesn't matter how big and beautiful something is presented to you as a false Christ, a false word, if it doesn't match the original simplicity of God's word, it's wrong. Just wrong. I know sometimes we all want something like, I wouldn't mind an angel coming and telling me, but that doesn't fit the pattern. That just doesn't fit the pattern. I'll be obedient to his word. He knows his bride will hearken unto his voice. She won't be moved by mountains. She won't be moved by earthquakes and fires and winds. She'll just be moved by the still small voice speaking through his word. And she'll walk right on into a rapture. Just so simple. Christ in the mystery of God revealed. The pregnated person with the seed of God, the word in there manifesting itself, so surrendered to the will of God that the word and the word alone manifests itself in the person. You see, it's a prisoner to an individual. It's individual, one person, all hell is against this teaching. All hell is against this truth, that God would reveal himself to you as an individual, so quietly, simply. Masterpiece, and when he had made his first pass masterpiece, he put him behind the word. When he made his second masterpiece, he was the word, amen. He was the word, not behind the word, but he was, he was the word. God never changes in his plan. That's exactly what he started off to do in his first church, was with the word. Now God, the word, in the beginning, he was independent from all other, everything else, all other people. Now I don't mean to say this to be different. God is a segregationist, you know that? You talk about integration, but God's a segregationist. He certainly does. He'll separate his own, his people from the world. He separated Israel, his nation. He is trying to separate his church from the world. But the, wor but the church wants to go on with the world. But his people is still segregated, segregated to him. Who is he? The word. You see, God's just going to bless both sides. It's not gonna, he's not going to just right now curse the other side that rejects his word. And he's going to bless that one too. But he knows there's another little people, little humble people, that'll be looking at their lives through the mirror, into the mirror, reflecting their lives in the mirror of God's word and seeing, hmm, something's not right. Remember, Christ in you is the hope of glory. This is the seventh seal on, on display, just so you know. It really is. It's the, it's the simplicity of a life of Christ manifesting in you. Really is. Where did he go? Where was he at? Where is that big fella, Brother Ben said? Hmm. Manifesting, expressing, learning obedience through much suffering in the form of a bride. Identified masterpiece. He's making a bride, yes, sir, and he's hewing and chipping her down, chopping off the world. Oh, church goings and creeds and denominations and their doctrines and their dogmas, all has to be cut away from the church, their ideas and their indifferences and their doctrines and everything. They've got to come back and let the master pick up the bow. Let the master pick, pick you up with his hands and strike the word. Say, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He'll strum your life and he'll strike your life and you know what your life's gonna speak? Jesus Christ. The word is the absolute. The word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And my life is speaking what that word says. There's the masterpiece in his hands. He's cutting you now. He's cutting you down to where it's the word only. He's cutting all the creeds and your dogmas and everything away from you. And he's trying to get a bride for his son, another masterpiece, part of his word. Now the great sculptor, see, he's counting on you, willing to stand and have yourself shaped into the likeness of his requirements that the word requires. He's counting on you to stand there and let him cut you. In these last days, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Christ is that identified masterpiece of the word made flesh. You are asked to identify yourself with him by the same word, to be the masterpiece of the bride. Matthew 5:44. Sorry, I'm going to keep laying it in. Now, let's 
So we know we are walking in his footsteps, right? Our lives have to walk in those footsteps into that perfection. In Matthew 5, 44, Jesus says, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. But what if they really said something nasty? Like, I mean, I, they're not even bride. That doesn't mean anything. Like, I've heard that, and it makes my stomach turn. They're not bride. They're not elect. I don't care. What spirit's in you? This isn't the spirit of Christ. This Christ is the word. And he said, you have to love your enemies. I listened to a, a brother, Earl Martin, I think it was, his testimony. And I think they were trying to, he was a preacher. He was trying to throw him out of the church. And there was a man in the church. He said, I'm going to get you thrown out of this church. You ain't ever preaching here again. And he said, well, and he said he worked up the whole church. And the whole church had a big meeting. Come to find out nobody wanted him out of the church, just this one man. And the man said, if you ever get in that pulpit and preach, I'm going to shoot you. And Brother Earl Martin says, you know what happened? He left and had a heart attack. And he said, serves him right. <laughs> That's what he said, serves him right. Brother Branham got word of, Brother Branham approached him. I don't know when it was, came to him and said, don't you ever get in the pulpit and preach again until that spirit's changed. He said, don't you ever get in the pulpit and preach until you can pray and love that man like your best friend. That's what he said. It's Earl Martin, Brother Earl Martin, if you want to. I listened to the testimony a while ago. Yeah, ain't that something? So if you can't love your enemies as your friend, see, there's a wrong spirit living in you. See, very simple. So where are we at? Matthew 5, 44? Yeah. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you and do good to them that hate you and pray for, you, pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son, listen, son, to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth his reign on the just and the unjust. For if we love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. So, do we have any criticism for anybody? Really? Nah, you really don't. You have no ability to actually condemn the other person. You, make it, you, can, you not have to agree with them and what they do, but you're not to hate them. You're not to, you know, just absolutely say, well, they're not my brother and they don't believe things the way I do. I'm telling you, there's something not right with that spirit because it just doesn't match the spirit of his word. Because you have to love those that hate you and would want to do evil to you. And he's saying the spirit of Christ and you will, will do that. See, it's a good checkup. It's a real good checkup. 1 Corinthians 3.1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet are you now able. So what disqualifies them? For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not yet carnal and walk as men? So if there's envying and strife and division among us, guess what? You're not even ready for the real meat of God's word. You're still yet carnal in your understanding. You're still not even got the spiritual mind of Christ to be able to look beyond those things and recognize your position and what you're supposed to do in those situations. Matthew 19.8, if you don't mind. And I love this. Years ago when I was studying marriage and divorce, I came across this, and it just, it just really thrilled me when I saw this. Matthew 19, 8, he saith unto them, Moses, because the hardness of your heart suffered you to, be put a, to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And as I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife except for the cause of fornication and shall marry another committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away doth commit adultery. His disciples say unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. 
But he said unto them, all men can't receive this saying, save them to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs which were born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which are made eunuchs of men, and there are some eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of God's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Because what he was saying was a very hard thing, and he knows it, but he's got a bride. He's got a people. He's got an elect that will choose to fulfill his word and even stay single the rest of their lives because his word said so. They love him more than that. The, the even to, and I know that's a tough one. Like that's tough. I, I, I'm not in that position, so I can't say I personally can feel it. But having one that has a wife, if I was in that situation and I find that it was not pleasing to my Lord and I did that, I say, God bless you, whoever's been able to take that stand for the sake of the word. You chose him over your own desire. You chose a harder way. You're walking with him. See, he's always walking that harder way, but it's always his way. And I just, I always love that scripture because it's, it just shows right here. With God, it looks tough. I'm not even denying. Or in the world, in the natural, it looks tough. But with God, all things are possible. All things are possible. And there is a group that will receive his word. Now, is everybody comfortable? Now, I did put this in here and I was like, I don't know if I should put all this in here. But I, I want, yeah, take a deep breath. Okay, we good for another hour. Here we go. So I want to read this, and I know you've heard it, but I just, I feel to read it. Pick up your pen. And I want to take my time in it, and I just want to bring out some certain aspects of it because I think it so summarizes the entire thought um, that I, I just, there's, there's no reason to preach on it when the Spirit of the Lord says, pick up your pen, I want to tell the church something. I think we should listen, right? So listen to this, if you don't mind, and I'll, I'll pause here for in the middle of it. Here's what I'm trying to say to you. The law of reproduction is each species brings forth of its own kind. Genesis 1, 11. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass and the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his own kind. His seed is in itself upon the earth and it is so. Whatever life was in the seed came forth into the plant and thence into fruit. The very same law applies to the church today. Whatever seed started the church will come forth and be like the original seed because it is the same seed. In these last days, the true bride church, Christ's seed, will come to the headstone. She will be a super church, a super race as she nears him. They and the bride will just be so much like him that they will even be in his very image. This is in order to be united with them, with him. They will be one. They will be the very manifestation of the word of the living God. Denominations can't produce this. Wrong seed. They'll produce their creeds, their dogmas mixed with the word. And will mongrel. this mongrelizing brings forth hybrid product. The first son, Adam, was a spoken seed word of God. He was given a bride to reproduce himself. There's the purpose of the bride. That is why the bride was given to him to reproduce himself, to produce another son of God. But she fell. She fell by hybridization, and she, she caused him to die. The second son, Jesus, was also, a spoken, or was also a spoken seed word of God, was given a bride like, like as was Adam. But before he could marry her, she had fallen. She, like Adam's wife, was put to the test whether she would believe the word of God and live or doubt the word and die. She doubted, she left the word, she died. From a little group of a true seed of the word, God will present Christ, a beloved bride. She is a virgin of his word. She is a virgin because she knows no man-made creeds or dogmas. By and through the members of the bride will be fulfilled all that was promised of God to be manifested in the virgin. The word of promise came to the virgin Mary, but the word of promise was he himself to be manifested. That's the one I want to hit. He himself. The reality of the hour in which we're living is shocking to me. 
And it's so humble, it's so simple. I mean, I was listening to Brother Chad and Brother Aaron and realizing that we're living in the very hour and it's so simple where God, there's an open door and there's a voice and a prophet to the age and he's calling us to come up higher and it's a rapture age that I'm getting called up into and the molecules of my body are changing. I'm being called out of dead denominationalism and it's happening and it's all happening right now. So simple and so humble that it shocks me. And I sit there with tears in my eyes, I'm like, Lord, how in the world? Billions of people, and you're letting me hear these secrets? You're letting me see you? I, I, I don't deserve this. I don't, I don't even, there's nothing in me good to deserve this. And I'm sitting there in just utter shock and amazement that God's allowed me to hear these things and then have a heart's desire to walk in those things. It's even the greatest desire of all. And that is, to me, what God's doing at this point. He's really, truly just hunting out a bride that just loves him. Really, really loves him, loves his word because he wants to bring himself into view again. And how will he do that when you take the word and it becomes a living word in you? As an obedient wife, as a correct husband, as a, you know, whatever you're doing at work, whatever it is, that's the word made manifest. And it's going to be so humble that most people won't even notice it. So very humble. You see, the whole idea of going back to something that's Pentecostal with we're hooping and hollering and shouting and tongues and earthquakes and fires and all these things, no. No, it's the Word and the Word only. It's time for the Word and the Word only to be manifested in the bride. Not that I would take away from any gifts amongst us. I believe they're there. But we're not looking for that as a vindication of His presence. We're looking for the Word made manifested as the vindication of His presence amongst His people. But that, word, but that word of promise was he himself to be made manifested. God was made manifest. He himself acted at that time and fulfilled his own word of promise in the virgin. It was an angel that had brought her the message. But the angel's message was the word of God, Isaiah 9-6. He fulfilled at that time all that was written of him because she accepted his word to her. The members of his virgin bride will love him. They will have his potentials, for he is their head, and all power belongs to him. They are subject to him as members of our bodies are subject to our heads. Now notice the harmony of the Father and of the Son. Jesus never did anything until it was first showed him of the Father, John 5, 19. The harmony is to now exist between the groom and the bride. He shows her his word of life, and she receives it. She never doubts it. Therefore, nothing can harm her, not even death. The revelation's a rapture, right? The rapture is a revelation. It's the word. She won't doubt the word, not one of it. And death won't be able to harm her, because he'll just believe the simplicity of God's word. For if the seed be planted, the water will raise it back up again. Here's the secret of this. The word is in the bride as it was in Mary. The bride has the mind of Christ for she knows what he wants done with his word. She performs the command of the word in his name for she has thus saith the Lord. Then the word is quickened by the spirit and it will come to pass. Like a seed that is planted and watered, it comes to full harvest, serving its purpose. Those in the bride will do only his will. No one will make them do otherwise. They have, thus saith the Lord, or they keep still. They know that it has to be God in them doing the works and fulfilling his word. He did not complete his work, all his work, while he was in his earthly ministry. So now he works in and through the bride. She knows that, for it was not yet time for him to do certain things that he must now do. For he will now fulfill through the bride the, that work which he has left for this specific time. Now let us stand like Joshua and Caleb. Our promised land is coming in sight, even as theirs did. Now Joshua means Jehovah's Savior, and he represents the end time leader that will come to the church even as Paul came as as the original leader. Caleb represents those that stayed true with Joshua. Remember, God had started Israel as a virgin with his word, but they wanted something different. So did the last day church. 
Notice how God did not move Israel or let her go into the promised land until it was his appointed time. Now the people might have put pressure on Joshua, the leader, and said, the land is ours, let's go up and take it. Joshua, you're all through. You've lost your commission. You don't have power like you used to have. You used to hear from God and then know the will of God and then act quickly. Something is wrong with you. But Joshua was a God-sent prophet, and he knew what the promises of God, he knew the promises of God, so he waited for them. He waited for a clear-cut decision from God, and when it came time to move, God placed, sorry, God placed the full leadership in Joshua's hands because he had stayed with the word. God could trust Joshua, but the other ones, but not the others. So it will repeat in the last day the same problems and the same pressures. Same problems and same pressures. How can I tell the two spirits apart, the Pergamian church age? Just give them the word test. And if they don't speak that word, you know they're of the evil one. As the evil one deceived the first two brides, he will try to deceive the bride in this last day, trying to get her to hybridize herself with creeds or just plainly turning from the word to a sign that would suit her. But God never placed signs ahead of the word. Signs follow the word. As Elijah told the woman to bake a cake for him first, according to the word of the Lord, when she did, as the word said, the proper sign came. Came to the word first and then watch for the miracle. The seed word is energized by the spirit. I like that. Oh, I like that. If you need to see the power of God manifested in your life, just do what the word says. Take him at his word. The word comes first. You need healing in your body. Take the word. Repent of everything you got to do. Then you can say, hey, devil, you got no right to be standing here anymore. I've done all that the word told me to do. Now I'm waiting for him to come and energize this word that I've taken a hold of. And what's going to stop that? God will confirm his word. So simple. You see, we wait for something to move upon us. Just take him at his word and then watch God do the action from that point on. Because that's technically what you're doing. You're taking a hold of God when you take the word. Just so simple. But what has happened to the word? The word has been put aside, this Laodicean church age. And God says, I'm going against you. I will spew you out of my mouth. This is the end. For seven out of seven ages, I have seen nothing but men esteeming their own words above mine. So at the end of this age, I will spew you out of my mouth. It's all over. Just makes you go low, (laughs) real low. John 12, 20, please turn. And there were certain Greeks that came to worship him at the feast. And the same came, therefore, to Philip. Which was, at, which was of Bethesda of Galilee. And they desired him, saying, Sir, sir, we would see Jesus. This really spoke to me. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew to Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Okay? Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abide alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. For this cause came I into this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then there came a voice from heaven saying, I have glorified it and I'll glorify it again. That's a bride. I believe that's a bride. He glorified it as a corn of wheat that fell in the ground and died and hated his own life, didn't get get a chance to even pursue those things he had a right to. And he has a bride that'll walk in those same footsteps, not pushed, not forced. By choosing, she'll choose him. Real, Real quietly, she'll just choose him. Matthew 11 says, come unto unto me all thee that labor and are heavy laden, laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. 
I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Philippians 2 says, let nothing be done through strife and vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. So let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. He just became a servant to the word. Just do the will of God, just the word and nothing more. Musicians, if you'll come, you'll be able to breathe. Revelations 22, 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. For I testify unto you, unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are in this, written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. He closes the whole revelation of Jesus Christ, warning the people, don't you ever take away one word, and don't you ever add to it one word. Otherwise, you have counted yourself unworthy to ever sit upon that throne with him. Never will happen. We all stand. If I'm going to say anything and echo it loud, his word is his will. That's what the amen said to the amen. 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 amen? Let's just bow our heads for a word of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you. Lord, thankful for this time that we've been able to gather together. Lord, I'm, I know I really messed up and jumbled it up, the, the thoughts. But Lord, I pray that the spirit of what was being said, God, clearly communicated, Lord, to your people. Lord, in so many ways, I find myself so ashamed by the attitudes and, and things that I've done, not even in years gone by, but in weeks gone by and months gone by, Lord, I'm ashamed. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you'd, no doubt, I appreciate your grace to show me where I'm wrong. And Lord, we all appreciate it, Lord, when your grace humbly corrects us, Lord. And in your mercy, Lord, you say, my son, I'm not going to let you go that way. You gotta, you gotta learn this obedience. You gotta come according to, to, to me, learn of me. I'm meek and lowly. I'm not aggressive, that's not my nature. I'm not forceful, it's not me. Lord, I so appreciate that and I admire that so very, very much. And it's my great desire and I believe all of our greats desires to be yoked with you in that. Lord, it's, you're, you're the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And Lord, I just pray that you would humbly forgive us for attitudes and. Lord, forgive us for words spoken against other brothers, even others that aren't even brothers. Forgive us for attitudes and thoughts and, and mean-spiritedness that we might have as treating human beings as less than human beings. Um, Lord, that ain't right and it should never be spoken amongst your people, Lord. We, we should be way higher than that, Lord. We, we should have an attitude and a spirit of love that so pulsates through us, Lord, that even our greatest enemy wouldn't be able to say, that man says and does evil things to me. He should be able to say, I'm mean to him all the time, but he's just always sweet to me. And Lord, I just pray that you'll find that in us, Lord. That we would, we'd find, you'd, you'd find a dwelling place, Lord, for that dove to lead every day according to your will and your purpose, Lord. And Lord, with all that's in me, I love you and I love these people. And 
Lord, I pray, Lord, if anything was said that wrong, forgive me. I didn't mean it in that way to be mean or hurtful. It's not my desire. I just want to see you high and lifted up. And Lord, I know the tactics of the enemy now a little better than I once did before. And I just pray, Lord, that through my mistakes, Lord, they'll find footprints to be able to follow a, a path where you lead them, Lord. And Lord, we just love you. We commit ourselves to you and ask, Lord, that you would search our hearts, Lord. That's, that's a scary thing, Lord, to see that you would even bless those that, that don't have a heart's desire for you. Lord, that's, that's scary, Lord. And um, Lord, we, we want to be found with your heart's desire. We want to be found as a bride that loves you more than anything in this world, Lord. And Lord, we want to be found faithful to that that calling that you've elected us to, Lord. We don't want anything to distract us and pull us away from it, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that your hand of mercy and grace would lead us and guide us, Lord, so that we can take that final step with you one of these days. Just love you in Jesus' name. <clears throat> you got a song? I just want to please the Lord. of who he was. He had a revelation of his proper birth given to him by his mother. It was handed down and he knew what he was called to in life. He was to deliver the children of Israel. But his initial effort, effort in deliverance failed. He killed an Egyptian, ran into the wilderness, was rejected by his brothers because Moses' initial effort to bring forth the word of God in his life was completely according to his own desire and his own thoughts, and he failed. And God let him fail, and he runs through the wilderness, and in the wilderness, through trials and through tribulations and through separations, amen, living with a hot-tempered wife, which is exactly what Moses need, begin to chip away at Moses' self-will and resolve. And, and he beat all of Moses out of Moses and he got all of the Egyptian training out of him until finally Moses couldn't do nothing right. Couldn't speak right, couldn't deliver anybody, couldn't do anything to help them down there in Israel. He, he got to the place where he was convinced he wasn't the deliverer, he couldn't do anything to help those people. And that's where God wanted him. Because God wanted, God, it never changed Moses' purpose, never changed his calling and election, never changed his sonship. It was still Moses. But Moses had to get to the place where Moses would have no confidence in Moses. So when God would tell him to do something, it wouldn't get twisted, it wouldn't get tainted. And then if he said, call for flies, he called for flies. If he says, go unto Pharaoh and, and cast down your rod, go and cast down your rod. Nothing extra, nothing less, just exactly what he was told. 
I wonder what it's going to take to get us in the same place. He's given us his word. He's called us. He's told us who we are and what our purpose is, what we're supposed to do in this life. Amen. None of that's going to change, but I wonder if he doesn't let us make, make these mistakes and fail so that we, we quit having confidence in us that we stop trusting our reasoning, stop trusting our ideas, our intelligence, and stop trusting our, even our years of experience till we get to the place and said, Lord, without your word, I'm not gonna move because I don't know what to do. I'll mess it up, I'll make another mistake, I'll, I'll fail you again. God, just show me out of your word and if I can see your word and take your word on it, I'll do it. And that way God can do whatever, so what, whatsoever God wants to do. He's going to have a bride, and I believe that he wants to do a work through his bride. I believe that. And it may be more powerful than we can imagine. It may be simpler than what we think. I don't know. But, but he's got to get that bride to where she gladly submits to the simplest of the simple commandments before he'll ever call for her to call for flies. Why would, why would he put that kind of power and authority into a bride who will not obey the simplest and littlest of things? seems like lately God is drilling down into our lives and dealing with the nitty gritty and the tiny and, and dealing with these things. But, but don't resent that. Just say, God, deal with all of me. Deal with all of me, Lord, everything. Just deal with it, Lord, because we have no idea what's coming next. And whatever's coming next, God needs to root some things out of our lives, some self-will and self-desire and own understanding and own intelligence. We gotta die out more to those things for whatever coming next, friends. God doesn't waste the preaching of the word. He doesn't waste the anointing that's going forth. It's all for a purpose. What he's looking for is humble submission, simplicity, and he can do a lot with that. I wrote down a phrase that I wanted to capture and not forget while Kyle was preaching. He said this, God can be expressed in the simplicity of his smallest commandment. I want to express God. I want to bring forth Christ in this day. Christ can be expressed in the simplicity of his smallest commandment. What is that? Manifesting the word. Do it in the little things. We do it in the big things. We do it in all things. And that's bringing forth Christ, the manifest word in this age. The amen is so be it. If God says it, he's the amen. If he's the amen, what will his wife be? The amen. And if he said it in his word and he stamped it with an amen, then I want to have the heart inside of me to stamp it back with an amen. God said, this is it. I want to say, this is it. God help us. I think all we can say after this is, God help us. Without your spirit, there's no way. Without an election, it's impossible. Without your choosing, it's impossible. You've chose before the foundation of the world or there's not a human being that could come to this level that God's calling for. But because he chose, now he'll send his spirit, the matching piece of that chosen part, amen, so that he can bring to life what's laying there, amen, so he can accomplish his purpose on this earth. Say, God, help us. Help us to yield to that spirit. Help, the, help us to catch revelation upon revelation that will quicken your word so that we can have, amen, so that we have a desire for your word so that we can just walk in that word. God, help us. Humble us, Lord. Let us walk in simplicity. And Lord, you know what? I'll say this last thing. You know what I believe personally? The greatest, most dynamic, if we can think of the most dynamic, most powerful demonstration to the world of Jesus Christ in flesh, if you can think of uh, 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 raising a dead person or whatever, It'll only be the simplicity of somebody obeying him. The same simplicity that obeyed him and not speaking evil of a neighbor is the same simplicity that'll bring forth the greatest manifestation you can think of. It's the same thing. It's obedience to his word and following his leadership. 
If we can do it in all the little things, then we can do it in the big things too. And if he can trust us with his, with his word, he can trust us to keep it all and to subject ourselves to it. He can trust us with everything. So praise God, that's what I want. Search me, oh God. Search me out. Uncover those things in me that where willfulness is laying, uncover it, Lord, I don't want it anymore. Where, where selfishness is laying, uncover it, Lord, I don't want it anymore. I just want your word on display. I don't know about you, but for me, it's becoming so serious and so subtle, it has me on pins and needles. I realize that in myself, I will fail him every moment of every day. And it's got me on pins and needles because I realize there's no capability in me. All capability is him. And I gotta be careful that I take enough time to listen to his voice, that I read his word, that I yield myself to it, or I'll wind up off of his program. He loves me. He'll chase me and get me back, but I, I don't want to depend on that. I want to, I want, my will is just to obey the first time. That's my desire. God help us. God help us. We're going to dismiss you in the name of the Lord. We love you. God be with you. God bless you. God use you. God change us from glory unto glory. Let us manifest his word above all things. Let's manifest his word. I just want to please the Lord Be in His will in every way To be lost in His presence Found in His likeness To hear Him say well
when Jesus comes. The tempter's power is broken when Jesus comes. The tears are Sign from above 